Uh, cue that up. Um, yeah, so uh, I want to tell you about this trip we just did. We took this vessel from uh, Nome, Alaska, we went up into the Arctic across the north slope, north of Alaska, and measured all sorts of things happening in the fall in the Arctic. And one of the, the some of the key things that are happening in the fall in the Arctic are that it's getting dark, quite dark. And so you can see this photo that uh, John took with a drone, and he did lots of drone flights out flying around, giving us a bird's eye view, both as something to you know show the public, hey, this is what we're doing, but also to help us see the ice that we're in, help us characterize the environment, help us see uh, where we're working. And this is taken at 11 o'clock in the morning. It's very dark. So uh, the consequence of that darkness is that it's getting colder, right? There's not much solar radiation coming in, and so the ice is returning. And the Arctic has a very strong seasonal ice cycle where the ice melts in the summertime because the sun is out and there's a lot of heating happening, and then the ice starts to return in the winter. So if you are paying any attention to the popular press and the science, some of the scientific press, the ice is melting. In general, the Arctic is losing sea ice. The Arctic is experiencing rapid climate change. It is really uh, dramatic how fast things are changing up there. Uh, but the story, of course, is always a little more complicated than that. And the big changes are happening mostly in the summer season when the melt occurs. And there is still ice coming back in the winter. And for a long time, there still will be ice in the Arctic in the winter. Uh, the big questions are, in terms of the large-scale ice patterns, are will there still be ice in the summer? Right now, there still is sea ice. There's still a polar ice cap in the summer. There, there very well might not be in the next 10, 20 years. Uh, no one really knows the answer to that, but we're certainly headed that direction. So this seasonal cycle is important to the overall system. And this seasonal cycle is why we decided to go and do this in the fall. And this is one of the only times that a US icebreaker, a ship like this, has been up in the Arctic this late in the fall. We were there for the month of November. Now, typically, uh, the month of November, the, the Arctic has sort of started to be closed for business from a, an icebreaker perspective because all the open water has started to close in and all the ice has come back. And so it's not really, even for an icebreaker, it's not really the place to be. Um, and, you know, the, most things have been focused on kind of that summer season. Well, that season is changing. The, uh, the warming that we're seeing in the Arctic throughout the summer has stretched the summer months so that November is, by some measure, still kind of late summer now. In November uh, because there's still open water and the ice that was coming back in previous decades would have come back in September or October is now coming back in November so it's really remarkable that we were up there in November this project that we planned uh, really if we'd done it a decade ago we probably would have planned to use the ship in October and requested the ship in October but because we're in you know 2019 was when we did it uh, we we requested November because of the, this trend of later and later and later in the fall that the ice returns. It's a really remarkable trend. So that set the timing of when we were there. Um, I'll show you exactly where we went with a little overlay map here. Well, that's not showing up very well at all. Well, in words, this is Alaska. This is Nome. This is the Bering Strait. We came up along the coast. We had a few sites that we were focused on where we were making more detailed measurements, and uh, and then a site, some sites further offshore. So all of this is the north slope of Alaska. This is Point Barrow, this is Prudhoe Bay. Fairbanks would be down here. And this is all the Beaufort Sea, which is part of the Arctic Ocean, and the Chukchi Sea. So that's where we were, that's where we took the ship. And that went over a month. And the, uh, the, the larger signal beyond that seasonal signal looks something like this, just to give you something quantitative about it. Um, this is the extent of ice, uh, the change in it, and this is what's happening late in the fall and September, and the other one, the other line is what's happening in March over the course of about 30 years. And so this red line, this is what you see lots of different representations of this in, uh, in the press, and hopefully you've heard some part of this story before. There's a lot less ice, and that red line is one way to quantify the, how much less ice there is. Uh, another way to do it is to look in plan view, to look down. So here is looking down at the North Pole right there, Alaska here, Greenland here. This is what the ice cover looked like in September of 1980, pretty much covering the whole Arctic Ocean. This is what the ice cover looked like in September of 2012, only covering maybe half of the Arctic Ocean. Really dramatic, dramatic change. So there are lots of things that go with that. Uh, one of the things you may have heard about is the, the way the ocean absorbs heat. That sea ice is white, it's very bright, so we say it has a high albedo, it reflects a lot of sunlight. The ocean is much darker, 
and it absorbs a lot of heat. It doesn't reflect as much. And so when you have all that open water, that really starts to change the amount of heat that the ocean takes up. That's one aspect. Another aspect that's a little less talked about, but that we've spent a lot of our time focused on, and we were measuring it in our previous expeditions on this ship and, and been measuring it on this trip, are the waves. And the waves are part of the story because waves need space in order to grow. And so the difference between this amount of ice and this amount of ice is a whole bunch of open water in which waves can grow. We call that distance the fetch. And so if you're here on Lake Washington, you have a very small fetch. And Lake Washington only gets small waves, even on a really windy day, maybe two or three feet in height. If you have a much larger fetch, for example, out off the coast of Washington, the wide open North Pacific Ocean, then you can get much bigger waves because you need space for the energy from the wind to become accumulated in those waves. It takes time and space for that to happen. So one of the big changes that we've been looking at in, the, um, in this open water extent is that fetch change. And here's some analysis we've done on the waves we've measured and how much energy they have on this vertical axis and how they depend on the amount of fetch. And this is the fetch is the distance of open water between the ice edge and the land. And so that has a very strong correlation. And basically, if there's more fetch, if there's more open water, then there's more wave energy. And we've done this with thousands and thousands of data points, and it really plays out almost all the time. It's basically, in the Arctic, the number one determinant of whether they're, uh, of what the wave energy is going to be. And so this is, right now, mostly a consequence of the retreating ice. But we have lots of science questions about whether it is actually going to start participating more and more in the, the changing ice. Because big waves can actually affect the ice. They can break up the ice. right? So there are feedback mechanisms here, similar to that albedo <laughs> feedback mechanism I was talking about, where once you lose some ice, you heat up the water, and then you've got more heat. Maybe you lose more ice. Right? We know that feedback mechanism is quite strong. We are uh, concerned there may be similar feedback mechanisms for the waves. But, uh, I want to show this another way just to, to, to drive home the point that if there's more fetch, then there's more waves, and that's been happening over time, right? I'm giving you two examples here going from 1980 to 2012. Definitely more fetch, definitely more waves. Um, we have used models to run what we call a hindcast, looking back in retrospective instead of a forecast, and look back and see what waves have been there uh, according to this fetch dependence. And over the last 30 years, 25 years, uh, it looks something like this, the wave heights of the upper panel over this 25 year span have been increasing. And this is a statistical value over the entire Arctic domain. Uh, so it, it, it's really, there's a lot of averaging going on here. Uh, but you can see this upward trend and statistically significant trend. The other thing that's interesting is this second panel, which is the wave period. So that's the spacing and time between the crest of two waves. That wave period is also increasing. Uh, and that's something we actually do expect from the additional fetch, right? We take, we're, we're going from, again, my analogy to Lake Washington, where the fetch is small and the waves are really short and they're spaced very closely together, to something more like the open ocean if you went to Westport and we're looking out and you see these much longer waves coming in because there's more space. Those waves, we often talk about uh, the maturity of a wave, whether it's had a chance to grow and become a more mature wave or a swell wave. And, we're seeing signals of that here, that not only are the waves getting bigger in the Arctic Ocean, but they're turning into a swell type wave, which has some different physics to it. Interestingly, the lowest panel, the wind speed doesn't have that trend, right? So from this analysis, it's not that the Arctic is getting windier. Uh, it's not that necessarily that the storms are stronger. It's just that there's more open water to make more waves. Uh, so we, from a bunch of different perspectives, we've been asking what are the effects of these additional waves? What are the effects on the sea ice? But in this particular project that we were just doing in this past November, the question we were after was, what are the effects on the coast? And here's a picture to, to drive that home. Uh, this is a big storm that hit the village of Utkjarvik, which was formerly called Barrow, very northern tip of Alaska, in September 2017. And if you look closely, you can see these big waves coming out here, hitting the beach, and then this entire part of the town is all flooded. There's a very strong sur storm surge there are waves that are overtopping the breakwater. The road here, this is Stevenson Road, has been uh, almost washed out, and there are things getting into the, uh, to the back pond. It's, it's a mess, right? There's a lot of uh, pretty dramatic coastal inundation and coastal change happening here. And this is something that uh, has rarely been seen along the north slope of, of Alaska, because the coast has mostly been protected by the sea ice, 
and the larger domain just hasn't had big waves. So you know, there's not a reason for, for this to happen. So these events are starting to occur along the coast, and we're trying to understand you know, how and when do these, uh, do these events happen, and what exactly is happening at the coast. And you know, particularly in the fall, what happens at this sort of in-between zone where there's a little, there is some ice, uh, and there also is still open water, so there's still there's some waves. Right? Uh, and often what happens in the fall is ice forms close to the shore first and makes shore fast ice. And we have been trying to figure out how much does that shore fast ice protect the coast. And if it forms early or late in the cycle, then does that uh, change how, you know, how much coastal erosion can happen when a storm like this comes through. If there was a band of, of shore fast ice along the coast here, uh, it would probably protect the coast from all this happening. Uh, so we've been looking uh, along the whole coast in addition to some of our focus sites and there's already some existing data on how much erosion is happening. Some of it's quite severe. Uh, this is the entire North Slope. So there's Point Barrow, Prudhoe Bay, Alaska here, Brooks Range here. And the color scale is the rate of erosion and the metric is the meters per year that the shoreline is moving back towards the land. So working its way backwards, the shoreline retreat Anything that's a warm color is a retreat number, it's, a, it's in the negative. And the yellow colors are something like a meter or two per year, the shoreline that's lost every year. The red colors are the really extremes, which are something like 10 meters per year. And there are a few particular cases where that's happening at Drew Point and Cape Halkett that are, uh, that are pretty unique in some ways. That's where the permafrost is uh, at the coastline is exposed directly to the ocean, and the warm water comes in and just uh, basically melts the permafrost and the coastline there is more melting than it is actually eroding and that is a big part of what's happening along these coastlines. There are other parts of the coastline that are uh, not ice bound sediments, they're not permafrost, they're more of just a gravel sandy beach uh, and those are also eroding. You can see everywhere here it's sort of yellow, red, you know there's not a lot of blue colors, right? Not, not much of the coastline is, is accreting or building up, it's almost all eroding. So uh, one of the big picture things we've been trying to do is just take that wave climatology increasing waves and tie it to the shoreline retreat. Uh, there's a model for that that has been used along a lot of other coastlines around the world, and it's an equilibrium model. And it just says that a coastline like the one at the Washington coast has been there for thousands of years and always seen about the same waves, so it's achieved some balance, the beach shape and everything, has equilibrated to the forcing that it's getting. So if these, the forcing here in the Arctic is changing dramatically, are we maybe changing the equilibrium shape and equilibrium behavior of the coastline? Is the coastline going to adjust to go with it. And so our some quick analysis on that that uh, we've started with but haven't finished is to look at the change in the wave heights, which I showed you earlier. This is the, really the same data from the, the panel I showed you before. And then to use that equilibrium approach and get the change in the shoreline. And we get numbers that over the most recent decade are something like one to two meters per year. That's, that's the yellow colors in the previous plot. So it's at least reasonable that that's about what's happening. There's an adjusting equilibrium. And then we need uh, the data from this most recent trip is really going to help us finish this off. And then we're going to revisit this by having calibrated models to work all the way backwards uh, and do this at higher fidelity. For now, I want to show you just a few more things from the cruise, which are that um, some of our measurements, some of the data we got. So we were working uh, at a few sites, Icy Cape near the Jones Islands, which is just to the west of Prudhoe Bay, and your Flaxman Island, which is the right of Prudhoe Bay. Those focus sites were chosen to places to, to get a more detailed set of data and leave moorings out over an entire summer into the fall when freeze-up is happening, and then put them back up for an entire annual cycle. So right now, while we're standing here, there are 12 moorings out that are collecting data for us, and they'll be out an entire annual cycle, and we'll be back on this ship in October of 2020, so this fall, uh, and we'll go recover all of that and get the data off that and, uh, and it should be a phenomenal data set. Uh, we did get this early data set by putting things out in August at these sites here and then we got to uh, pull that data and get a sneak peek at things and I'll, so I'll show you what a little bit of that looks like because I think it's fascinating. I'm going to do it as a histogram not a time series but I just want to know about how big are the waves, what's happening with the waves. And so this is at one of the sites the number of occurrences of waves of different heights. And this is in August, it's dark blue, September's light blue. So for the most part, the waves are about a meter high. It's not very big waves. Uh, and then occasionally, especially in August, in the summertime, there are waves that get up to three, three and a half. This is pretty typical. This is about what I expect, at least in the modern Arctic. You know, the, 
the old Arctic, maybe 30 years ago, the waves would really never get above a meter, but now they regularly get to three or four meters uh, because there's so much fetch. Yeah. Uh, what was fascinating about this to me when it was unexpected is that uh, here is the uh, what happened in October. But first, what was the ice doing in October, right? Because that underlies the whole story. Well, the ice in October was really nowhere near the coast. And so in this, again, looking down North Pole, Alaska, there was this enormous expanse of open water of fetch in October. The annual mean was the yellow line. So usually in October, the ice would be all the way back to the north coast of Alaska. But this year, and many recent years, there's this enormous expanse of open water. And October tends to be pretty stormy. There's a lot of wind coming in. So the wave height distribution from October is the yellow. And there's a real peak of very active energetic waves here, three, four meters. That is pretty distinct distribution from the the, uh, the other distribution. So this is really a, a unexpected to me, at least, that in you know, October sh things should be getting quiet and calming down. But instead, it's the other way around. This is some of the most energetic stuff that we've seen. Um, so we're definitely going to be focusing on this as we start to do more data analysis. We want to be able to, to model this, forecast this, uh, and understand what the implications are for the coastline. OK, and the last thing I'll tell you about this, uh, this stuff happening by the coast is uh, when there's wave and ice together, what happens? Uh, and what happens is you get these pancakes. It's called pancake ice. That's actually the technical term for it, pancake ice. In this image, they're about this big, you know, half meter or something like that. And they form because uh, the ocean is at the freezing point. The air is very cold, so as you're losing heat, constantly pulling heat out of the ocean, then, uh, then you hit this transition point, you start to make ice. And as the ice is being formed, instead of making a flat sheet the way it would on a pond or somewhere to go uh, where there's not any, uh, any motion, the waves are rolling through and they're moving everything around. And so they prevent that flat ice from forming. And they cause little bits of ice to flocculate together, collect together. The ice is buoyant, comes to the surface, and that starts to bump into its neighbor. And as it bumps into its neighbor, it starts to eventually make these pancakes. Uh, so we did a lot of measurements of these pancakes. These are some of the buoys that we put out. We make these buoys here at the university, and we deploy them all over the world. And they measure the waves, they measure the temperatures, they tell us you know, how fast things are freezing and what the waves are doing in there. Uh, and I think the, the most useful thing is to see a video of what this looks like, because it really gives you a feel for the, the motion that's happening. Um, and you can see how the pancakes may form. You can see that in the crest of each wave, the pancakes, they get pushed together. And then in the trough, they slide apart. Really what's happening is actually on the front face of the wave, they're sliding down the slope and they're bumping into each other. And the back face of the wave, they're getting stretched apart. And that's how they're forming. And so what I think is cool about this, this, is, this video was actually taken in 2015 on one of the first trips uh, that I did on the ship and one of the first trips that this ship did in the Arctic, because it's a pretty new ship. Hopefully you'll hear more about that on the tour. And uh, pancake ice is something that really was not seen very much in the Arctic, certainly not reported. Uh, and that's really because there weren't the waves to make pancake ice, right? These two things go hand in hand. Pancake ice is ubiquitous in Antarctica, down south, because the Southern Ocean is enormous, infinite fetch. There's always tons of waves, so lots of pancake ice down there. Uh, but as an observation in the, in the Arctic, had been pretty rare. Now we see it all the time, right? Um, we had collaborators out on the US Coast Guard Healy, the other icebreaker that's uh, uh, often in the Arctic and is home port here in Seattle. And they saw tons of pancake ice this year also. So um, that sort of the new ice type now in the Arctic is this pancake ice. I'll play that one more time just because I think it's, uh, it's really cool. You can also see how uh, the ice has been changed a fair bit. Uh, I mean, so the waves are also changed. Everything's kind of smoothing out. So the two things are affecting each other. Uh, so we are trying to model and forecast this, and we have uh, a big project team that's working on this, most notably for the next few slides. There's uh, Lucia Haskova and Nirni Kumar are we're working together on this to be able to model this. And, just force it to go. and uh, so here's an example of running that model, uh, again along the Alaskan coast, with, uh, and we're looking at the effect of this ice, in particular this ice being near the shore, and saying, well, what does that ice do to the waves? And if we run the forecast and we have wind that is uniform everywhere over that whole domain, you would think you'd make uniform waves everywhere, but you don't. You make waves that are preferentially big out here in open water, and then they're damp, so they're smaller in the ice, and so that ice that's there is protecting the coast. So this is one example, and we're running lots of examples like this. So I want to leave it there at that. I would say we had a second trip on Sekuliak that just happened by chance to be back to back, and that trip went out uh, 
in the North Pacific and took us from Alaska to where we are now, to Seattle. Uh, and we were storm chasing on that ship, and we can do we can talk more about that uh, later. That uh, but it was a different project, and I think the Arctic thing is the most the biggest focus there. But I'll just say that other trip was also about waves, but in that case, it was about understanding how waves break. And when they break, they form bubbles, and the bubbles get into the upper ocean, and that's when gases are exchanged. Gases like carbon dioxide, gases like oxygen. And so we were trying to understand that process. That